just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I call. I go just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb. Of God I come, I come, just as I am thy love unknown, and broken every beggar down, now to be thine, yea, thy Alone, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roll farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him your burden and you shall be blessed, he will not turn you away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice. Give him today, give him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise in the way. Calling today. Calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. And for me, see on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? 
special music this morning. I've got a medley of praise choruses we sang back in the 80s. And if y'all know them, sing along. One of them is, uh, is, is the scripture that's based on is in our message this morning. Our Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thy great power. Our Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. Great and mighty God, Great in counsel and mighty indeed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing is too difficult for thee. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. Jesus, 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 oh. He is the king, and I love him better every day. 
I love him better every day. Close by his side, I will abide. I love him better every day. I love him better every day. I love him better every day. Close by his side, I will abide. I love him better every day. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, he is the king. I mentioned last thing last week a sermon about 10 things God can't do. And most people would say, well, God can do anything. Well, I'd agree with that. But here we go. I'm going to show you today 10 things that God can't do. And I know you think I've lost my mind. But stay with me. I think you'll agree with me after we cover a few of them. Number one, God can't get tired. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. So we see here that God does not become weary. He doesn't get tired. We, we, if we look back to the creation of heaven and earth, after six days of creation, on the seventh day, God rested. But I don't think he was tired. I don't think God gets tired. He rested as in he took a break. But this scripture says that God doesn't get tired. We don't have to work worry about overworking God or overloading him with our prayers and petitions and our needs. We don't have to worry about that. God is always able. He's always ready and always on call. God is plenty big enough for the things that we need and he doesn't get tired. And he doesn't get tired of hearing from us either. Number two, God can't take on a job that he can't handle. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 says, Ah, Lord God, there's a song we sing, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and earth by your great mighty power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for God. There is no problem too large. What man sees as a huge problem is just child's play for God. God created the heavens and the earth and us in six days. God raised people from the dead. We spent a, a previous sermon, I don't remember if it was last week or before, talking about mighty things that God did. And he did. There is no problem too large for God there is no job that God can't handle it's impossible for God to take on a job that he can't handle number three God cannot be unholy this is a big one here God cannot be unholy holy it means exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. Is that who our God is? Perfect in goodness and righteousness? Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And the one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Matchless, majestic, supreme, terrifying, omnipotent, infallible. These are words that describe God. There is no uncleanness in him. God is 100% holy. Unlike the ivory soap, remember the commercials where they said ivory soap was 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure? That's not God. God is 100% pure. There is no lack in him. Number four, God can't be prejudiced. Aren't you glad? You know, everyone on this earth is prejudiced in one way or another. No living person can make a completely unprejudiced decision. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Which nation did it say? It said every nation. God doesn't believe in segregation. The only segregation that God knows is believers and non-believers. That's the only two distinctions between any two people. The scripture tell us that there, in the kingdom of God, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. There is no difference. We're all the same. The only difference is believers and unbelievers. Number five, God can't break a promise. Psalm chapter 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. It's kind of like my mama. If she told me I was going to get a whipping, I was going to get a whipping. See, the boy, wait till you get home, I'm going to give you a whipping. And I'd so hope mama would forget. She never did. She'd remember that. She might not remember anything else, but she'd remember that she owed me a whipping. And I'm sure I had it coming too. It might not look to us like things are going God's way. We say, wait a minute. He said this and I'm looking at it seeing that. Well, rest assured, God will not break a promise. <clears throat> if it looks to us like God broke a promise, it's our problem, not his. We just don't see clearly what God is doing or has done. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let me see what you are doing. God is so much bigger and so much higher than us. He's got things going on. And it's always righteous. It's always holy. And it's always what he said he was going to do. Even though to us, as mere humans, it may not look like things are going the way God said they would. But rest assured they are. Number six. This is one that I particularly like. God can't remember sins once he forgives them. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And then in Micah 7, verse 19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I've had a couple of opportunities to go on a cruise. You get on a big ship and you cross over the Gulf of Mexico and go to Mexico. Well, while you're out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, it's 15,000 feet deep. You can't see land. You can climb up the highest place on the ship and look around and you can't see anything but water. And then you go over to the handrail on the side and look down at that water and you think to yourself, boy, if I drop something in there, it'd be gone. Never see it again. That's what God does with our sins once he forgets them. Cast into the depths of the sea, never to be seen again. Another scripture talks about as the east is from the west. 
If you take notion and start traveling to the east, you can go on and on and on and you'll never reach the west. You can go all the way around the globe as many times as you want to and you'll never reach the west because it's always out there. That's the way our sins are after God forgives them. Now, y'all may not have a lot to be forgiven for, but I, old Dave here, I've done some bad things. And I'm so grateful that God doesn't remember them. You know, the neat thing about that, we're, we as humans, we, we can't forget things. We can't forget things we, we, we want to forget. Now, things that we don't want to forget, we forget them real easy. But when somebody does us wrong, we can't forget that. So every time that we remember it, we have to forgive them all over again and we have to deal with that pain. But see, God's not like that. God can forget. He can delete it. Just like you delete something off your computer, he can delete it and it's gone. Now, you see, there are experts that can, after you delete something off your computer, they can raise it back up. But now with God, it's gone. Once you're forgiven for a sin, that's it. He doesn't remember it anymore. One of the songs we says we sing says, and your iniquities remember no more. <clears throat> Number seven, God can't make a loser. Now, I'm sure none of y'all ever felt this way, but on occasion when I was growing up, and then since I've grown up, not that I've fully grown up, there are times when I felt like I was a loser. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. God leads us in triumph. We fail when we do not allow him to lead. The nation of Israel would go into battle. And when they were right with God, and they took on the battle that God told them to. They were victorious every time with very little effort because God fought their battles for them. Now, when they would go into battle and they weren't right with God, they would take a really bad whipping, really bad whipping. You'd think they would have learned, but they didn't. And that's the way it is with us. When we are following God's lead, we cannot fail. Again, it might look to us like we're failing, but God is going to have the victory. He leads us in triumph. If things aren't panning out, don't blame God. You are victorious. You are victorious in Jesus. Stand on that. You might have to wait. You are vict victorious in Jesus. Number eight, God can't abandon you. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, we might read over that and not really think anything about it that we're adopted. But look at this. Let's look into the, the context. The Roman Syrian law book, where a formerly prevalent Greek law had persisted under the Roman Empire, well illustrates this passage of the epistle. It actually lays down the principle that a man can never put away an adopted son <clears throat> and that he cannot put away a real son without good ground. It is remarkable that the adopted son should have a stronger position than the son by birth, yet it was so. My understanding is that under our laws, you can't disown an adopted child. How cool is that? You see, unless you're a, or a descendant of Abraham, 
you weren't heir to God's promises. But when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the scripture tells us that we were adopted by Abraham. Therefore, we are heir to the promises that God made Abraham. We can't be we can't be kicked out because we're adopted. We can't be disowned because we are adopted. God wouldn't send his son to save us if he planned on letting us go. We are all God's chosen by adoption. As adopted sons and daughters, we cannot be disinherited. So God can't abandon you. Number nine, God can't stop thinking about you. Psalms 139 verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. The psalmist here thinks of God's careful planning in the creation of his own spirit, soul, and body. How precious are his thoughts. God's attention to the minutest detail. Each cell, almost without exception, in our body knows its role in carrying out design or purpose for the welfare of the body as a whole. God never forgets about us. We are always on his mind. All eight billion of us. Y'all know how many a billion is? If you take a billion dollars in, in one dollar bills and you count up one every second, it take you 33 years if you never stop to count a billion. That's how big a number a billion is. And there's eight billion people in this earth. And God can't stop thinking about any one of us. We're on his mind. Number 10, God can't stop loving you. Jeremiah 31 verse 3, the Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's comforting there. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's what God says to us. That's the kind of love we all want. It reminds me of the prodigal son. You'd think his dad wouldn't have wanted to have anything to do with him because he'd been so bad. But his dad loved him with an everlasting love, just like God loves us with an everlasting love. And when we make a mistake, God still loves us. He wants us to repent and stop messing up. But when we do it again, he still loves us and he forgives us again and again and again. No matter how mad, bad we messed up, God loves us just the same. Everlasting love never even considers divorce. When we consider that we are one of eight billion on the planet and God can't stop loving any one of us, that means we have a big God. And it's a good thing he's also a loving God. You know, I worked with a, a few men that were really, really, really large, big, big guys. It's a good thing they weren't mean because if they'd have taken notion to wreak havoc and start hurting people, we, there's nothing we could have done. They were too big. We couldn't have done anything with them. Just think about how big God is. Aren't you glad he's not mean? Aren't you glad his loving kindness is forever? God is love. His love is everlasting. Now, <clears throat> To be perfectly honest with you, God could do any of these things that we mentioned today. But he won't because he told us that he wouldn't. This is who God is. That doesn't change. So theoretically, God could do these things, but you don't have to worry about it. Because he's not going to, because God is not going to go back on his word. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want us to fail. He wants us to win. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Why else would God give us the perfect Savior if he didn't want us to win? Why would he offer his own son? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not want us to fail. He wanted us to have a way that we could be right. Some might ask, why would God condemn us to hell if he loves us? Well, I'm going to answer that, that God's not going to condemn you to hell. He's not going to. You might condemn yourself, but God won't. God made a way. You know, if you were in the water drowning, I use this example all the time. If you were drowning and somebody threw you a rope, if you refused to grab a hold of that rope so they could pull you to safety, would you say that they drowned you? No, goodness no. God is throwing us a rope. He wants us to be saved. He gave his best. He gave his one and only son the way for us to be saved. If we believe in him, we'll be saved. God doesn't condemn anybody. We condemn ourselves if we refuse to accept Jesus. God doesn't want anyone to miss heaven. God wants us all to be saved. But you see, it's our choice. Well, that's the message for today. I hope there was some nuggets in there that you could get some use out of.